So we will cause uh, this lot of talks with uh, the mystifying AI by G in Geo by Andrew Chapovsky. He also hold a little bit of uh, small talk during the slot that were opened relating to Panda. So hopefully he has uh, energy and strength to oh, yeah. close up this one. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. Everybody say cheese. cheese. Right before we go to dinner. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this is a uh, talk on demystifying artificial intelligence in Geo. And uh, there's been a lot of great talks so far this whole week. And I've had the f uh, pleasure of being able to attend some. And some I missed, unfortunately. So hopefully I'll get to see them later online. And um, really a lot of times when we're a beginning programmer, we, we sort of start hello world and then we just jump right to this world of uh, doing AI and machine learning and we think we can instantly do everything. And uh, it, it's good to have you know the gumption to do that, but really uh, it's good to understand some of the basics behind it and what it is. So I'm gonna cover some information here and I'm gonna talk about AI, ML, and deep learning uh, and where it comes from and where we go and then some tools to help us, help you. And then the more important thing is I'm gonna show it in action. So I'm gonna to try to get through the slides first and then show some code and hopefully you all like it. So artificial intelligence is an umbrella term that started in the 1950s and AI, uh, d d deep learning and machine learning are all subsets of artificial intelligence. And really back then when artificial intelligence first started, it, um, they were doing things like playing chess and you know, they were doing some computational things, but it was more, uh, you know, the computational power really wasn't there or the hardware or the software. Uh, we had the algorithms, but they were still slow overall. And as time goes on, we get to the like, 80s to the 2010s, and that's when machine learning starts, really starts taking off. And here we're gonna use algorithms to find patterns within our data. And we're gonna use, take these models and we're gonna make predictions off of information that we had in the past. And then we get to today, the 2010s and, where, and, and beyond, and we're getting to uh, deep learning. And this is where they introduced the idea of neural networks and multi-layers with hidden layers and, and you're, you're mimicking the brain on how information can get from one end to the other. And we, we sort of, sometimes people feel like it's a black box of how information goes in and an answer comes out, but that's okay. So traditional machine learning namespaces follow things like retail and market and healthcare and even finance. And here we, you, know, you have things where you're doing market segmentation with retail and then you have fraud detection both in the financial and healthcare world. But also there's a whole geospatial component that sort of fits in with all that. Um, one, uh, one of my favorite open source sayings is spatial is not special and it applies with machine and deep learning as well. So traditionally, we have two types of machine learning uh, that you see. You have supervised and unsupervised. And with supervised, you, know, you have your classifications working on labeled data. And these are things like uh, random forests and your regression. So you have your linear and logistic regression. Then you have unsupervised, and these are things that you see a lot, and that's uh, k-means clustering, db scan, you can even use uh, unsupervised for dimension reduction. So uh, if you have lots of data, um, lots of columns, sometimes you need to reduce it down and you can use PCI and SVD. So deep learning, the goal of deep learning and the focus of really where, where we're trying to get is that deep learning is trying to mimic the human brain. And I mentioned that before and, and it's gonna follow some common and it has some common algorithms that you might've heard when reading things on the internet and uh, you have your neural networks, your deep belief networks, your recurrent neural networks, and it's gonna try to learn the best you can. Um, I was talking to somebody earlier today and I was trying to create an analogy about this and it was, I was using my daughter uh, when she was first born and it's sort of like uh, every time you train data and you run an epoch, it's sort of like teaching them a new word. So, you know, they, they make a sound and you say, no, it's more like this, you know, and you keep going and you, you, get, you get better results as you go along, but it's really sort of like that. You can, even though it's more complex mathematically and everything, and maybe it isn't for a child learning to words, it really, that's how it is. It's, it's like training somebody who doesn't know yet. And we're gonna use algorithms to look at huge, vast amounts of data. And we're gonna take that and then take actions or perform 
some function based on the derived information. Excuse me. So learning steps are pretty simple and at a high level, but we have data and we, we hope it contains a pattern or we want it to contain a pattern, so we're gonna look for it. And we're gonna train our data using some model to be named yet, and you're gonna iterate over it multiple times. And let's assume we find a pattern with our data, so that means we can recognize that pattern, so we have what's called a model. You then take this information with new data and you're gonna use your model and you're gonna derive new predictions out of that. So that's the general learning steps that we're gonna follow at a very, very high level. And these learning steps can be applied to computer vision on geospatial imagery and we're gonna focus on two types, object detection. So we're gonna look for something that we wanna find and draw a bounding box around it. Or you can do pixel classification. And this is where you take every pixel within an image and assign it some sort of class whether it's a, a letter or a number, and you generalize it. So uh, here we have what's called a single shot detector, and the basic idea is that we're gonna have one network that we're gonna go off for because we want it for speed, and uh, we're gonna try to find bounding boxes around it. And the image on the upper left-hand side, you can see with the dog, the bicycle, and the car, is the goal, so we're gonna basically say uh, that's a dog, we're gonna draw it in one and a bicycle and identify and just put, we're not actually gonna take the full image and the boundary on it, we're just gonna say this is that and this is something else. But to apply it to a geospatial problem, you can take it a problem like pool detection or finding oil pads and just drown, uh, drawing the bounding box around that. We can also use, uh, for our, our pixel classification, we can use UNET and with UNET, we're gonna do uh, semantic segmentation. And one of the advantages of using UNET is that it's computationally efficient, and it's, you can train it on very small data sets. And the goal here, if, if you recall the previous bike example that we had with the, the dog and the, the bike and the car, we were just drawing bounding boxes, but now you're actually taking the area where that thing exists and assigning all those pixels within that area, that specific class. So, a lot of you, uh, I've heard, are doing land use land cover. This is a great way of doing that. Uh, it's, it's computationally efficient and you can use existing land use cover data sets to apply it. But some other applications of doing this are, in, uh, especially the autonomous vehicle driving, uh, you can use um, for semantic segmentation, uh, medical imaging diagnos uh, diagnostics for finding cancer within patients, uh, precision agriculture, finding areas that need to be improved, maybe looking at moisture, things like that. And then we have land use land cover classification, which is a traditional GIS problem. Now the ArcGIS uh, is a platform built for deep learning, especially the ArcGIS API for Python. And it's gonna help you with your deep learning workflows and still give you the ability to pick the backbone that you use to do those. Uh, it's gonna give you tools to help you uh, prepare your data and get, create the labels that you need, train your models, and do model deployment so you can share it with your colleagues around the world. So uh, if you want the GUI approach, you can use ArcGIS Pro along with Image Server to perform the deep learning. But if you're, uh, if you're like me, I prefer to do it via command line, you can use the ArcGIS API for Python and you can do all these steps. So the ArcGIS API for Python is where we're gonna focus our demos on, and the ArcGIS API Python is a free piece of software that anybody can download and install, and there's two ways to install it. If you don't have ArcGIS Pro, you can do conda install and then uh, put in the Esri repository and the uh, package, or you can use pip install ArcGIS. And the ArcGIS API does more than just learning. It also uh, contains a whole bunch of ways to do uh, geoprocessing, other raster analytics, uh, both in memory and um, through services. It has a space enabled data frame. Uh, it, it does geo enrichment, geo coding, all the things you can sort of expect from a standard uh, GIS library, it does. On top of that, you can also do rich visualizations with it. So, like I said before, installation is easy. It's a little easier to see on this slide. You can use condos or pip. And, but we're gonna focus on ArcGIS Learn. And inside the ArcGIS API for Python, uh, 
you know, uh, as analysts or geospatial data scientists, you, you can apply your uh, deep learning workflows quite easily. And the, uh, the whole idea is uh, a lot of packages out there, they all have, they all do deep learning and uh, machine learning, but they have different interfaces as you use different, like Kira's and other ones. So we took and standardized the inputs so it's the same experience regardless of what you want to use to power your learning. And the module is going to include methods to export training data, do the data preparation, model training, etc. So let's take a look at some examples of doing this. We're going to start. We're going to start out by um, first uh, doing some unsupervised clustering. So here we have. We're going to use uh, in the United States. There's this uh, data set called the uh, wind turbine data set and it provides all the locations of the data sets that are both onshore and offshore. And we're going to see how they cluster together. And we're going to use k-means algorithm to detect our clustering mean algorithm. And we're going to leverage scikit-learn and we're going to use the spatial-enabled data frame to do that, which is a pandas data frame with uh, spatial capabilities. And we're going to group our data using similarity and focusing on the, um, the the, the uh, lat long of the locations of our data set. So for those who don't know, if you have data uh, that's just point data sitting out there, it, whether it's uh, actual geographic data or just two coordinates or um, it, that could look like this. Uh, the, oh, it didn't switch over. Thank you, PowerPoint. Somebody should have said, hey, you messed up. <laughs> Sorry, I was going through code as I was talking. <laughs> so, uh, so we want to uh, measure the similarities between uh, objects and what we're going to do uh, for for that long. And we can we can calculate our k-beans by using scikit-learn and uh, passing in the number of clusters that we want and predicting out data. So we had locations that look like this. Now, visually, you can see that there's most likely three uh, three groupings together but we can show it by using uh, Euclidean distance and the sum square errors, SSS, the, for inertia, and we're gonna pass in, get our labels, apply it, and we get back our, uh, our clustering along with our centroids. So now getting back to our data, that's a, little, that's a quick two second brief uh, approach on k-means. So we're gonna load in our spatially enabled data. In this case, it's coming from a shapefile that was provided by the US government. And we have our various locations. So we have both our data along with our, um, our geometry. We can then go through and start calculating the number of clusters. We can use the elbow method to determine the number of clusters with k-means. And in this case, I'm going to take this and I'm just gonna do four for the sake of the demo. Go through and calculate our number of clusters, run the analysis, and display the results on the map. Sorry, I jumped through that, but it's running, I'm running out of time. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, doing another machine learning technique and focusing on random forests. And so before we had a unsupervised method, and in this method we're going to use supervised method. Uh, and for those who don't know, and uh, who might not be in the world, the importance of seagrass is uh, seagrass is like the rainforest of the ocean, um, and they're disappearing on the surface, like much of our green space on, on, uh, on land. And it provides an area for shelter for fish and other wildlife within the ocean, and it also is a key uh, imp um, important part for uh, sea towns where economic um, and where it affects local economies. So if they disappear, not only do, do you affect the wildlife, but the people that live in the area will also be out of work and possibly famine and other impacts. So how can we figure out where, um, how can we use, uh, predict where there should be seagrass based on known locations? So we're gonna load our data in, and this time I'm gonna pull it down from a web service hosted out by Esri as a feature layer and then uh, convert it to a spatially enabled data frame. And then just so you understand what it is, we have a bunch of columns like uh, the number of O2 nitrate concentrations and things like that. Uh, and those are gonna be, we're gonna use those as our information to do the, make a prediction or help us predict our values. 
We're going to convert data from um, to categorical to save some space on memory because categorical data is, um, if you have in pandas, categorical data is very memory efficient. And then we're going to evaluate to see the correlation between our predictors. This is just one way of visualizing it. I'm going to create my uh, training and test data. I'm going to split it up so uh, my test size is going to be 15% of my data. So we have uh, test size is 15, uh, training size is 15, test is 85,000. We're going to create our classifier. So we're going to use uh, the random forest classifier in this case. And we're going to go ahead and fit our data to it. You can, once you've done that, you can then determine which variables are actually important. And notice three variables that we picked, C2, C1, and C3, aren't very important. So we could drop them, but I'm not just right now. Uh, we're then going to, you can go ahead and make a prediction on our test data that we had, the 15% the we had before. We're going to calculate, and then we can go ahead and calculate our accuracy with what we predicted. After we do the calculation, our model, you can see that we only had accuracy of uh, 60. 1.4%, and so we didn't do fairly well, so we would want to go back and reassess what we found and uh, reapply and make, maybe either modify the values we use to predict uh, our locations of if seagrass should be there or not. But that's just an example of using random forests. All right, so now I want to get to deep learning, which is the other side of what we're going to do. And uh, two minutes, okay, so I'm going to talk about it very, very fast. <laughs> So what you have when you do uh, d deep learning within the ArcGIS platform is that you have your training data and imagery. And this can come from both services, local data, or um, hosted on ArcGIS Online, or um, other publicly available data sources. Uh, we've done it with even uh, WMS as well. So if you have OGC, uh, WST. So uh, it first starts by creating your, uh, training your data model. And that's just done by exporting your data. And this is going to help us create the information that we need and uh, so we can do our classifying. So once we export our data based on the area or our samples, we're then going to go through and train our UNET algorithm because we're going to be doing that pixel classification. So we can start. Uh, I'm doing this on a server. So I'm going to I set my data path where I want everything to go. And I'm going to prepare my data. I, I specify the batch sizes, and once that's completed, I can then look at my data bunches. Now we can go ahead and create our classifier, and we have to determine our learning rate, and we have a tool to help you. Uh, so it's, fast AI, it's based on fast AI, and it's our learning rate finder. So there's general rules. So uh, the learning rate finder, for those who don't know, plots the learn rate versus the loss rela uh, relationship for the learner, and we want it to. It's going to help you reduce the guesswork to predict a good starting point. So first you run the uh, LR find function that we have built in, and then we're gonna um, examine the plot, you examine the plot like we have here, and then you pick the learning rate uh, before uh, it diverges to start the training. So here we're gonna do uh, e to the negative four. Uh, because UNET's very efficient, you don't have to train it very much. Well, I'm not gonna train it much here, so I'm only gonna train it 10, I only trained it 10 times. And you can display the results. So you have uh, truth versus prediction. And you can see already that we missed some, some I only trained it very little, and I had a very little uh, test data, because I just wanted to run it really fast. So we have our, like we missed water and uh, some buildings. But that's OK. This is just to show the actual purpose of what's going on. And if we're uh, happy with our data, we can persist it to disk and share it out. So this, uh, it initially saves to a zip file, or you can save it out, uh, for example, to a portal on ArcGIS Online, so you can share with your other colleagues. Uh, you can then, once you have a model, you can then reconsume it and train it on your other data. So if you remember our learning pattern that we followed, we had existing data, we trained it, so we've done that so far, and then we developed the model because we found a pattern. Now we're going to take this model, we're going to load and install it, and we're going to use it on new data to make a prediction. So we load it in, and then we call classify pixels on our new set of uh, imagery. It takes some time to run, so it took about a minute for the area that I'm doing, and it made a, uh, a classification here. Now, uh, uh, 
very, this wasn't a very good model. It's just to show how easy the actual workflow is and how there, you don't need to do a lot of classification to do that. Uh, what you would do next is you would probably add more training data and re-optimize your parameters for going in and train your data more in order to, to get a better prediction. But in a few lines of code, if you didn't break it up, you could have a complete land use land cover case of showing that without actually having um, have to send somebody out in the field like you would traditionally do with land use land cover or using other uh, other techniques as well. So I believe I'm out of time. So you said two minutes. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, um, I have another demo if anybody wants to show which is doing um, single shot detector and using that to finding bounding box around the data. Um, we can go offline after we're done. But uh, I'd like to take some questions before we run out of time. So. Got to stay on the formula. Oh, maybe not. I've been kicked out. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. Am I right in thinking that the single shot detector is a, a single pass one that's yes. commonly used for video, real t more real time stuff as well? No, it, it, it doesn't have to be used with video. Okay. No, you can do it with static imagery. Okay, but it's yeah. a single. Yeah, it's single pass. Uh, single pass at the yeah. image. Right, okay. That's what makes it fast. I mean, relatively fast, you know, depending on the area you're doing. Thank you.